Welcome to NTN Nightly. I am Janelle Novel. This edition Stop Stories. The House of Assembly approves VAT exemption on imports by parliamentarians to benefit their constituencies. The Ministry of Health raises the alarm on breaches to home quarantine protocol. And the National Sports Academy continues its success story with its first graduation ceremony. The House of Assembly, by affirmative resolution Tuesday, approved the draft value added tax amendment of Schedule 3, Number 2 order, which amends Schedule 3 of the Act to exempt imports by an elected parliamentarian for the benefit of children, the vulnerable, and the needy persons in the constituency of the elected parliamentarian of toys, food supplies, care packages, including items for personal use, to be given as part of the Christmas holiday season. It is one of several measures instituted by government to assist various segments of the population in mitigating the impacts of COVID-19. Minister for Commerce, Industry, Investment, Enterprise Development and Consumer Affairs and Parliamentary Representative for Shrozel Saltibus, Honorable Bradley Felix, threw his support behind the motion. He explained that all parliamentarians are afforded the opportunity to make use of the provision. The Minister for Commerce added that the Cabinet's May 29, 2020 approval of the granting of concessions on barrels imported at Christmas provided an additional avenue for the importation of goods and food items for the underprivileged in the various constituencies. The Cabinet further approved the transmission of the appropriate legal instrument to Parliament to declare barrels imported during the period June 2, 2020 to January 31, 2021 exempt from value-added tax. Mr. Speaker, the only difference in this is one, parliamentarians were identified, parliamentarians were identified, and we added the, the lighting. Prime Minister of St. Lucia, Minister for Finance, and Parliamentary Representative for Miku South, Honorable Alan Chastney, highlighted the impact of the barrel concessions approved by Cabinet in an effort to provide relief to the poor and vulnerable people in St. Lucia. In 2019, Mr. Speaker, the total number of barrels that came in between November 15th and January 31st was 16,482. And there was a CIF value of 11.83 million, and there was approximately 4.2 million dollars in foregone tax revenues, and 709 thousand dollars in foregone service charge collected. Thus far, Mr. Speaker, from June 1st, because you remember that we went because of the extraordinary situation to allow barrels to come in from even earlier. And as was mentioned, that we increased the allocation from two, which would be the norm, to three per household. And we did it on a timely basis. So thus far, Mr. Speaker, um, as we speak as of December 1st, there was 26,000 barrels that have been imported, a CIF value of 18.6 million, approximately $6.6 .6 million in foregone duties, and $1.1 million in foregone service charge collected. So, Mr. Speaker, government has foregone close to $8 million in tax revenue to help, in many cases, the vulnerable. Parliamentary Representative for Grosile and Minister for Equity, Social Justice, Local Government and Empowerment, Honorable Leonard Montout, explained that the government, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, has been making strides towards alleviating the burden on the poor and vulnerable. He noted that the government has increased the grants for and expanded several vulnerable groups. The minister informed that the Child Disability Grant, the allocation for the Child Foster Care Program, and the funds to beneficiaries under the Social Assistance Program Living with HIV are a few of the groups who received increased support during the COVID-19 pandemic. He noted that the Public Assistance Program has also been expanded. Mr. Speaker, that program since COVID-19 has grown from a total of 2,600 households to 
3,600 households, an increase of 1,000 households. An increase of 1,000 households. Mr. Speaker, we had extension officers of my ministry engage in field work. Okay? Going around in the, for the uh, rectification of the PAP program, that is Public Assistance Program, ensuring that we, in our expansion, got to the people who were most in need. The motion was passed in the lower house on Tuesday, 15th December 2020. The COVID-19 home quarantine monitoring team of the Department of Health and Wellness has not been able to contact a number of individuals who arrived in St. Lucia during the period Saturday, December 5 to Tuesday, December 15, 2020, and are on home quarantine. Every individual on home quarantine is monitored by a health officer through telephone calls. Therefore, it is imperative that persons are truthful in providing the accurate contact details. While arrivals present a negative PCR test, a failure to provide accurate information results in persons not being contacted and monitored for COVID-19 signs and symptoms. The ministry is urging persons to contact the assigned health officer of their district within 24 hours if they have not already been contacted. Failure to do so within the stipulated time will result in the publication of persons' names and information in the next 24 hours to facilitate their efficient review. The Ministry of Home Affairs is working together with the Ministry of Health and has already been alerted on this present situation and will provide the necessary support. A list of the contact information of health officials in the various health regions is as follows. Region 1, Grosley. Health Officer Chantal Alexander can be contacted at 518 -1919. Health Officer Jason Arthur can be contacted at 723-4391. Health Officer Peter Lynn Polidor can be contacted at 722-6581. In Region 2, that is Babano, Fuanso area, Health Officer Veronica Deborah Bledman can be contacted at 723-4286. In Region 3, the Denry area, Health Officer Esther Nestor can be contacted at 722-6435. In Region 4, the Miko Deriso area, Health Officer Rosemary Compton can be contacted at 723-4475. Region 4, also the Miko Deriso area, Health Officer Alice David can be contacted at 723 723- 4314. In Region 5, that is VA4 Library and Environs, Health Officer Soto Woodhouse can be contacted at 518-1952. Also Region 5, VA4 Library and Environs, Health Officer Lancia Edwin can be contacted at 723-4312. In Region 6, that is Sufre and Environs, Health Officer Curling George can be contacted at 723-4406. In Region 6, that is Sufra and Environs, Health Officer Patricia St. Croix can be contacted at 723-4394. In Region 7, that is Ancillary and Environs, Health Officer Sharon Pinder can be contacted at 723-4393. In Region 8, Castries and Environs, Health Officer Sophia Margaret Regis can be contacted at 723-4459. In Region 8, that is Castries and Environs, Health Officer Melisha Wilson can be contacted at 518-7886. The island's chief medical officer is urging the public to step up their vigilance ahead of the Christmas season. Noting that the festive season is traditionally a time for shopping, parties and overall merriment, Dr. Sharon Belmar George says the island is at a heightened risk for the spread of COVID-19. Over the last four weeks, the Ministry of Health and Wellness has guided the nation through a second wave of the novel coronavirus resulting in decreasing cases. 
As of Tuesday, December 15, 2020, St. Lucia had 31 active cases and four total COVID-19 related deaths. There were 243 recoveries with no critical cases in care. A total of 17,801 tests have been processed. The Ministry of Health and Wellness continues to monitor both the global and regional situation and analysis as we assess our risks and make recommendations. We note the steady rate of increasing cases in most countries as they experience their second wave. We continue to monitor closely and we learn from the best practices implemented as we strengthen the existing protocols. As countries open their borders and social and economic activity increases, the risk for transmission also increases. St. Lucia, just like the rest of the world, remains at high risk for the introduction of COVID-19. Our main risks include the increased numbers of returning nationals and visitors from areas of high incidence of disease, the illegal entry through the borders, the non-adherence to protocols, the breaches to home quarantine, and the hosting of mass crowd social events. Every visitor, returning national, and illegal entrant must be managed as a possible positive COVID-19 case. It is imperative that we remain vigilant at this time to keep ourselves and our families safe. As we celebrate the Christmas season, let us all remain on alert and continue to play our part to protect the health and safety of our family, friends, colleagues, and neighbors. We ask all to minimize their movements, avoid social gatherings, and other activities which will bring about greater exposure to the virus. The CMO commended communities, the business sector, faith-based organizations, the hospitality industry, and other partners who continue to support the national effort in the management of COVID-19. The St. Lucia National Sports Academy has continued its journey of success with the hosting of its first graduation exercise. Hamadi Mark reports. Graduation often signals the start of a new journey. Such was the case for 15 students of the St. Lucia Sports Academy. The institution held its first graduation ceremony on Friday, 11th December 2020, since its transition from the Grosley Secondary School in September 2019. The principal of the St. Lucia Sports Academy, Delia Alsendor Charles, addressed the graduates and highlighted the significance of the prestigious occasion. Graduation, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the most important days in our school calendar. And you students know that it marks the conclusion of your secondary school journey that has nurtured you over the last five years. This is our inaugural graduation as the St. Lucia Sports Academy. You are the first cohort of students to graduate from this new and prestigious institution. And from what we have seen, you will make great strides and reach your goals. Also present at the graduation ceremony was Chief Education Officer Dr. Fiona Philip Meyer. She encouraged the students to excel in their future endeavors. Students, I congratulate you. And I ask you not to limit yourselves, no matter what you do. You can be the best bus driver ever. You can be the best small business person ever. You can be the best technician you can be the best professional. Whatever it is, do not limit yourselves. The guest speaker for the event was Hilary Schalmine. During his inspiring presentation, he encouraged graduates to be prepared to make sacrifices to attain success. In the face of seemingly insurmountable circumstances, pioneers are not easily deterred, dismissed, or derailed. On the contrary, they will remain resolute with the perseverance, determination, and the tenacity to run the race to the end and to accomplish the task that has been assigned. Awards were presented to students who performed exceptionally well during their five-year tenure. Amelia Luke captured several awards, including Best Academic Student, the Principal's Award, Student of the Year, and several other subject awards. 
Debbie Augustine was presented with the Best Overall Female Sports Award, and the Best Overall Male Sports Award was captured by Dorian Augustine. From the Government Information Service, Hermari Mark reporting. Individuals, businesses and households are being encouraged to access financing at concessionary rates to undertake projects designed to combat climate change. The Climate Adaptation Finance Facility is available at the St. Lucia Development Bank. Rajvara Lawrence reports. Given the country's high vulnerability to climate change, the government of St. Lucia has embarked on creating the Climate Adaptation Finance Facility, CAF, a U.S. $5 million line of credit under the St. Lucia Disaster Vulnerability Reduction Project. Stemming from recommendations provided during private sector and civil society consultations under the pilot program for climate resilience, the CAF will offer concessional climate change adaptation loans through the St. Lucia Development Bank to individual households and businesses. From the homeowner's perspective, Persons can look to see how they can strengthen their retaining walls, they can strengthen their roofs, persons can put in shutters, persons can look to, to harvest their rainwater to make them more um, self-sustainable, persons can put on photovoltaic systems to produce their own electricity for energy efficiency. We've also seen it for businesses and the full spectrum of businesses from the farmer um, to the, you know, the contractor um, to the big business. We have facilities that will allow persons to, again, make their business more resilient. The greater frequency and intensity of extreme weather and chronic climate impacts impose real costs on communities and companies. Extreme weather causes property damage, disrupts business operations, and affects global supply chains across the economy. Sectors more closely tied to natural resources, such as agriculture or tourism, are particularly vulnerable to changing climate conditions. The St. Lucia Development Bank Climate Adaptation Finance Facility will be offered at interest rates between 4 and 7 percent per annum. A lot of persons, first of all, they started to take on solar water heaters. Then with the drought, we saw them taking on rainwater tanks and creating their own storage. For the farmers, they came and they were asking for the bigger tanks, 15,000 gallon tanks, which is things that they need because we saw how the drought impacted everyone severely, particularly um, you know, our food security. This special financing arrangement can also be used to fund drought and disease resistant crops, soil stabilization, greenhouses, retrofitting of roofs and buildings, and the installation of photovoltaic systems, which convert sunlight into electricity to power homes and businesses. On November 20th, the Department of Economic Development, in collaboration with the St. Lucia Development Bank, went one step further and launched the Climate Adaptation Financing Facility Business Recovery Program. The St. Lucia Development Bank, um, through its partnership with the DVRP, was able to have the, the World Bank and its partners, the Climate Investment Fund, repurpose the Climate Adaptation for Financing Facility. And not that it's going to move away strictly from its core mandate, which was looking at making solutions, um, their households, their businesses more resilient to the climate, but it now takes into consideration the impact of COVID. So they are, they are allowing us to be able to build a level of resiliency for persons who were impacted by COVID. The intention is for persons to submit a business plan to us with their financial statements showing how they were impacted. The St. Lucia Development Bank will be on lending the CAF BRP loans at a starting interest rate of 3.75% with the minimum loan amount of $20,000 while the maximum loan is capped at $200,000. Grants up to 15% of the loan will also be offered to micro, small and medium enterprises. We do thank the World Bank and the Climate Investment Fund for facilitating this sort of transition, but also for the, our partners at the Economic Development um, Unit at the Ministry, from the Minister down to Mr. Um, Tommy Descartes, who was very instrumental in getting us to this position of being able to facilitate and assist solutions in their recovery to the COVID. The CAF, BRP grant and loans will be provided for projects that support business continuity and recovery from the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and or for climate resilience 
with a grace period of six months. From the Government Information Service, Rajvaro Lawrence reporting. This is NTN Nightly. Please stay with us. Accident encore. Eh, eh. Mi de bef mo la. En go to ho. Et pi yon bel vache. De machin kwaze. Ek moun blesi. Ah, non, mes ici dam. Bagay sa la kan ni pou dubout. Stray animals are endangering human lives and property. Livestock owners, please ensure animals do not stray on roads, highways, and public places. Remember, sections of the Animals Act 2005 states. Stray animals will be seized and put in a pound by authorized persons. Owners will be liable to a fine of $5,000 or two years imprisonment or both. Save innocent animals. Save human lives and property. A message from the Department of Agriculture. Welcome back. The Department of Agriculture, Fisheries, Natural Resources and Cooperatives has officially opened a diagnostic facility in Union. Anisia Antoine has the details. As the demand for agriculture continues to expand through the growing needs of society, so does the constant threat of the introduction, establishment and spread of pests and diseases, as well as climate change and predial larceny. The newly established National Agricultural Diagnostic Facility will enable production challenges to be approached scientifically through the diagnostic expertise of the laboratory system, thereby strengthening value chains that provide improved access to more affordable, better quality goods. Director of Agricultural Services Dr. Aurea King Snark says the establishment of the diagnostic facility will play a vital role in the industrial and socio-economic development of St. Lucia. I want us to take full advantage of NADAF to efficiently and timely diagnose diseases that can impact on our socioeconomic well-being. Just remember, the ability to control, contain, and eradicate a disease with little economic impact is by early detection, warning, and action. Perfecting weights and measures and calibration of, of equipment by the St. Lucia Bureau of Standards continue to play a vital role in the industrial and economic development of St. Lucia, as these services ensure guaranteed accuracy and reliability of measuring instruments. The inclusion of the Metrology Lab at this premises would serve to enhance our clients' confidence in the processes as periodic calibration of equipment against national standards would be performed. Director of the St. Lucia Bureau of Standards, Vernie Manuel, informs the Metrology Lab has been awarded accreditation to ISO IEC 17025-2017, General Requirements for the Competence and Calibration Laboratories, effective November 2nd, 2020. ISO 17025 specifies the general requirements for the competence to carry out our tests and calibrations, including sampling. It covers testing and calibration performed using standard methods, non-standard methods, and laboratory developed methods. Accreditation means that the SLBS laboratory has been assessed for technical competence in calibration services, and the calibration results produced meet all specifications for technically sound findings. The Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries, Physical Planning, Natural Resources and Cooperatives, Honorable Ezekiel Joseph, is enthusiastic about the operationalization of the facility and its benefits. Food safety is critical. Food safety is something I've been speaking a lot about. And I'm sure with the operation of this facility, we shall be able to produce the type of products that our consumers would have confidence in and of course, we can see the continued con um, consumption of our, our locally grown products. The National Agricultural Diagnostic Facility is funded by the European Union under the ATP BAM program. From the Communications Unit of the Department of Agriculture, I am Anisia Antoine reporting. The CARICOM Secretariat has signed a memorandum of understanding with the Caribbean private sector organization on the implementation of the CARICOM single market and economy. More from Toussaint King English Francis of CARICOM News Time. 
the full participation of stakeholders, including the private sector, labor, and civil society, is essential for the success of the CARICOM single market and economy, the CSME, says CARICOM Secretary General Ambassador Erwin Leroy. He said so as he signed a Memorandum of Understanding on the 3rd of December with the CARICOM Private Sector Organization, which was recently accorded the status of a CARICOM Associate Institution. The MOU aims to secure cooperation between the community and the private sector towards the full implementation of the CSME. The treaty provides a framework, a legal and administrative framework to create a single market and economy. But it is the stakeholders, it is the stakeholders who will make it a reality. The private sector who will be able to take advantage of it to the extent that we provide the, the means of, for which they can do so. It is our citizens who can take advantage of it in terms of the free movement of skills. And that would include, of course, the, the, our labor partners and other stakeholders. We've always known that for the CSME to be a success, we need an arrangement of inclusion with, with the private sector. I have been on public record saying so. The Secretary General praised the political impetus and direction of Barbados Prime Minister Mia Motley, who is laid head of government with responsibility for the CSME, as well as Mr. Gervais Warner, chairman of the CARICOM private sector organization, who signed the MOU. Mr. Warner says the action that the MOU will set in motion will place the community on a path of accelerated development through the CSME. Uncontroversial though the text of the MOU may be, it is, however, important that the parties, as well as those representatives who will be charged with the responsibility to implement the MOU, are thoroughly proficient in the new rules established in the MOU. If we are to avoid any unnecessary differences arising in the course of our work together. We are confident that the goodwill that has been engendered in the cooperation fostered and the resources applied to the fulfillment of the objective of the MOU, we believe set us, un set us unmistakably on the path of accelerated development for our region, and in particular towards the achievement of the goal of full implementation of the CSF. Engagement with the organization has begun and it is already on some regional committees, including those focusing on e-commerce, the regional food security plan, the common external tariff, and the rules of origin review. The organization has submitted a plan for the reduction of the region's significant food import bill, which the Secretary General says forms a blueprint and should be urgently transformed to an implementable plan of action. It has also submitted a risk assessment for the safe reopening of the regional economies during this difficult time of COVID-19. The CPSO has observer status on the organs and bodies of the community when they meet on matters of the CSME. Bad report by Toussaint King English Francis of CARICOM News Time. That brings us to the end of NTN Nightly. Join us next time at 7 p.m. with a repeat at 7 a.m. You can also catch up with us anytime on the St. Lucia Government Facebook page or YouTube channel. I am Janelle Norvell.